Why is it so important that we study apologetics? Why, is it, why, why do we need to study these things? It's important to give us a defense. It's important to give us a way to, to explain our faith. But at the same time, there's a, there's a little more to it than that, too. There's a value to just being informed. I saw this this week, and I just felt I needed to share it. Um, I saw a video uh, this past week, and it was basically kind of demonstrating how uninformed some people are. Um, This was, I'm not sure how long ago it was, but Joe Biden, we know who Joe Biden is, right? He was going to Hollywood for something, right? And they wanted to do a little test. So they went out on the street with a camera and a mic, and they asked people, who is Joe Biden? Who is Joe Biden? And they asked people over and over again. The answers ranged from, I think he's the governor or something, to isn't he a terrorist organization, Joe Biden. People had no idea who this guy was. Closest answer that they showed, I'm sure somewhere there was somebody who got it right and they cut it out, but the closest answer they showed, some guy said, isn't he the assistant president or something? (laughs) All right. Don't be like that. It's good to be informed, not just in politics, but in spirituality, in your faith. We need to know what's going on. We need to be able to give an answer um, to people who ask us. So, someone tell me, this is our third night talking about evidence for God. What were the first two nights about? Anybody tell me? Oh, we all looked in the notebooks. (laughs) What was our first argument for God's existence? Anybody remember? Cosmology. What in the world is cosmology? Maybe I should say, what in the universe is cosmology? (laughs) Anybody remember the cosmological argument we talked about? Basically, the, uh, the universe began to exist. If something begins to exist, it must have a cause. The only thing that really makes sense as a cause for the universe would be a god, a creator being. Okay, what did we talk about last week as evidence for God? Anybody remember? Creation, design. We see unbelievable, immensely complex and fascinating design all around us. And so you can either take an enormous step on faith and say that happened accidentally, or you can be a little more rational and say maybe there is an intelligent mind behind it, an intelligent mind we call God. So today uh, we are going to start... We're, this is our final night talking about evidence for God. And this is the argument from morality. And I'll be honest, this is my favorite argument because in my experience, this one is the most effective. However, you have to be extremely cautious because this is a very um, hot button kind of issue. People can become very defensive. So you have to be very smart and very careful about how you present this argument. But in my, in my experience, this is one of the most powerful arguments for God's existence. Basically, the argument is that there is a connection, an inseparable connection between God and morality. If we believe that there is such a thing as right and wrong, by necessity, there's a connection to a creator because of that. We'll talk about that just a little bit. Um, remember what I said a long time ago when we started this class a lot of the arguments we're bringing up here, a lot of them are common sense things. We're just organizing them in such a way that they show that God exists. So, let's look at a passage of Scripture really quick just to start off. In Psalm chapter 19, we actually cited this last week. Psalm chapter 19, verse 7, it tells us, The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. Now, this passage, and well, lots of passages in the Bible, make two things extremely clear. Number one, there's a God. And number two, he has given us a moral law. A moral law comes from God. All right? Now, I'm going to give you guys a test. Remember I gave you a few tests last week, showed you a couple pictures. You guys remember that? 
Put your thinking caps on. Don't overthink because, I mean, this is not a trick question. I'm going to show you a picture of two people. And I want you to tell me if you believe that one of these two people is more moral, is a more moral person than the other. Can you do that? Okay. Thinking caps. Ready? These are the two people. Okay. Who's that on the left? Anybody know? Mother Teresa. She spent her entire life taking care of the poor. I actually heard a guy speak one time who had spent time with Mother Teresa. He said that if you could ever see her feet, her feet were gnarled and deformed because whenever they got a new shipment of shoes at the mission where she was working, she would make sure everybody else got shoes first. Then she would take the last pair, and a lot of times it was too small. And from years of wearing shoes that were too small, her feet became deformed because she wanted to make sure other people had comfortable shoes. Mother Teresa, and of course we all know who that is on the right, unfortunately. Are one of these two people more moral than the other? Okay, well, it depends on what you're using to gauge. Yeah, now, I know they both have had sin in their life. They both have done things that were wrong, and they both had a need for a Savior. But I'm talking about the overall, more, the overall lifestyle of these people. One of these lifestyles more moral than the other. Absolutely. That's common sense, isn't it? Obviously, Mother Teresa was immensely more moral. Now, that was essentially a test. So if you answered yes to that question, congratulations, you believe in objective morality. You believe that it actually exists. So, if we all agree that Mother Teresa is more moral than Adolf Hitler, then we have a starting point. We are all on the same page. That's great. What do I mean by objective morality? What does it mean if something is objective? See it. Okay. Firm evidence. You can actually see it. Obvious. It's obvious. It's 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 uh, it's consistent all the time. So what what's the opposite of objective? Subjective. subjective and subjective is something that's what subject to change. It's not necessarily consistent. It's not the same. Some people have different opinions. It's not obvious to everyone. Okay. Well, let me give you the basic moral argument here. All right. This is our logical formula that we use. The moral argument is. Objective moral values exist if and only if God exists. That's the big one. We've got to prove that. Objective moral values exist if and only if God exists. Second, objective moral values do, in fact, exist. We all agree on that. And actually, almost everyone you talk to will agree on that. So the only logical conclusion is that God exists. Okay? Now... Uh, let's look at, let's explain objective and subjective really quick here. These two comics kind of, um, kind of, kind of illustrate it pretty well. Subjective, what are they doing, guy and the girl? What are they doing? Eating cake. And why is that an example of subjective? One of them likes it, one of them doesn't. One of them loves it. She thinks it's the most delicious thing ever. He can't stand it. That's me and Brie, by the way. Everything I like, she doesn't. Everything she likes, I don't. But, um, we, we managed to make it work, though. Um, Subjective. So subjective is a matter of opinion. Things can change. Things can vary. If I say this is the most delicious cake in the world, well, that's not necessarily an absolute fact. That's an opinion. But some things are objective. You know, those are, I guess those are oranges. Four oranges. One, two, three, four. Anybody with half a brain can look at that and come to the right conclusion. It's obvious. Four. Right? Now, when we talk about morality, being either objective or subjective. If morality is subjective, it means that nothing is really absolutely wrong and nothing is really absolutely right. It would really mostly be a matter of opinion. It would change. It would depend. But if we're saying morality is objective, it means that there are some things that are wrong for all people in all times and all circumstances, and there's no exceptions to it. Does that make sense, what we're saying? Because this argument that we're talking about is dealing with objective morality. If there is such a thing, if there is even one thing in the world that is objectively right or wrong, then this argument holds true. Okay. So, there is a strong connection now between God 
and morality. There has to be a connection there. Um, basically, you can't have absolute right and wrong without God. Why? Because if you have right and wrong, you're assuming that there is a law that must be obeyed. And if you're assuming there is a law, logically you have to assume that there is a law giver. Someone has to give that law. For example, we have laws in our country about murder. And if you murder somebody, then you will go to jail and you will face penalties because of that. Well, why do we have that law? Well, we have some leaders that sat down and wrote out the law that you can't murder somebody in this country. Okay, well, if that law, if morals, moral values like that transcend even a country, where do they come from? Who gives them? And so the big question here is this. What are objective morals rooted in? They have to be rooted somewhere. If you think that there is something that is absolutely right and absolutely wrong, why? There has to be some sort of reason. And you cannot, what, what it really come down to is you cannot explain why there is such a thing as right and wrong if there's no God. Well, why would something be wrong? Well, because I think it's wrong. Well, if you think it's wrong and someone else thinks it's right, well, then who wins out? Well, lots of people think it's wrong. Well, what, what if some people, I mean, if, if someone does what lots of people think is right, can lots of people be wrong? Ultimately, there's really no solid ground for morality unless there is a God. Okay? Um, but just for the sake of arguing, let's examine what else could be a ground for morality. Have you ever heard anyone say that? What do people think that morality is based on? I don't know. Have you ever heard anything? Why do people think it's more, something is moral or immoral? What, what's their reasoning? For example, uh, the, the big topic right now, you heard that um, gay marriage is now legal in Virginia, right? So if someone says um, that they think that gay marriage is right, or they think that it is wrong to oppose gay marriage, you say, well, why? What's their reasoning? Why would they tell you that it is right? I, mean, I don't know. What, what would you guys? It feels right. Individual rights. And if I want to make the argument for good debates, like arguing for good, just they're just created that way. Ah, you had to say created though, so you had to invoke. You had to invoke God for that. But uh, yeah, based on feeling. Well, let's talk about several popular. Um, explanations for where morals are rooted in, and we're going to challenge each of these assumptions. Very commonly, people believe that morality is rooted in the individual. The individual. People think that every individual gets to decide what's right for them, right? Okay. So um, here's the problem with that. That's not really objective morality. That's subjective. If every individual gets to decide... You can't really say that one thing is wrong for someone else. You can only say what's wrong for you. And besides, if it were objective, that would mean, you know, if you get a room with a hundred people, you're going to have some agreement and some disagreement, but you're going to have some degree of variation. You're going to have a hundred different moral law codes. Everyone is going to disagree to some degree about what is right and what is wrong. Um, and so what you come down to is only one person can be right. Uh, if that's the case. So why would one person be right over another? What gives them the, the power to force their morality on another person? Um, giving an example, uh, if someone comes up and takes your wallet and stabs you, in your opinion, that's wrong. To them, that's right. Who's really right in that matter? This is a true story. I am not kidding. This is a true story. Um, a, a guy in a seminary was got to go with his class and sit in on a uh, on a philosophy class, and some you know uh, doctor student, doctoral student was giving a lecture on morality in this philosophy class, and he was saying basically every individual gets to decide what's right and wrong. On the front row, big guy, football player guy, his neck was about as big around as a as a tree, right? Raises his front hand and says, or raises raises his hand in front. And he says, um, "What what parking lot do you park in?" The guy said, I park in that one over there. He said, okay, you go over there about what time? He said, about that time. Why? He said, I'm going to meet you tonight and beat you up and take your money. The guy said, you can't do that. He said, why not? You just told me that if it's right to me, I can do it. It may be wrong to you, but it's right to me. You see the problem with saying that the individual is the standard of morality? 
I have a theory. I think some people actually assess morality based on the individual, but it's not themselves. It's uh, like their favorite actor or their favorite comedian or somebody. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that, but um, you, you because you know, like gay marriage is such a big topic right now. You have actors who come out and they say that they support gay marriage. And it's like this big dramatic thing. They support gay marriage. And it's like they expect everyone to just say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's stop all debate on the topic because Patrick Stewart supports gay marriage. So it must be right. And that's how some people think. I, sadly, I'm afraid there are some people. I wish there weren't. But I'm afraid that there are some people like that. Um, that's how some people assess morality. Does that make sense how the individual cannot really be the source of morality? Because that's not really objective morality. Okay? Uh, here's another common one that doesn't make a lot of sense. Majority opinion. Can the majority opinion be the standard of what is right and what is wrong? The claim is that morality is determined based on what most people think. Now, the problem is nobody actually wants their well-being and their morality to be subject to a majority opinion. The majority opinions are fickle. I mean, after all, majorities have been in the wrong before, haven't they? Okay. Um, Unfortunately, in this day and time, it becomes one that is turned by the minority of the people. Well, even sometimes people base it on minority. You're right. Um, well, what does this group, are we oppressing this group, and so should they get a, get a say in, in something? Um, yeah. But think about it this way. Let's say, uh, let's take a topic like, I don't want to keep going back to gay marriage. Let's take a topic like abortion. All right? Is abortion right or wrong? Several years back, a majority of people believed that abortion was wrong. Well, let's say that, I'm not sure what the, what the number is now, let's say that the tables turn and more than half of people start to think that abortion is right. And then it turns again and more than half of people think that it's wrong. Does that mean that it was right and then it became wrong and then it became right again? Or it was wrong and became right again? I mean, can morality change like that? That's awful fickle. It can't be based on something like that. It was always wrong. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I give you an extreme example there. If a majority of people believed that it was morally acceptable to torture and kill others for fun, would that be moral? If a majority said, this is moral, well, no one's going to say that's moral because at the real heart of it, everyone knows you can't base morality on a majority opinion. In fact, related to this, let's, let's do a quick history lesson. Related to this, who can tell me specifically, as specifically as possible, what kind of government we have? What is our system of government called? Republic. A republic. Usually a lot of people say democracy, but we are more specific than just a democracy. We are a republic. And there's actually a very important reason for that. You see, our founding fathers recognized that a majority opinion was not always the absolute. That was not always the standard of right and wrong. And that's why they formed a constitutional republic. Now, if you have something, say, called a direct democracy, 51% is absolute sovereign rule. That means if 51% believes that it's okay to pillage your house and take everything you have, they would be allowed to do that. That's why we have a constitutional republic, because there are certain rights that are lined out in that, and no matter what, if you have a 99% majority, you can never vote away someone else's rights. You see, our founding fathers even understood there is a standard outside of a majority opinion. I'll give you an example. The First Amendment to the Constitution says, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So if 99% of people in our country wanted to make religious belief and practice illegal, could they do that or should they be able to do that? Absolutely not, because there is a right that voting, that, a, that majority belief cannot overcome. Now, here's the question. If a majority belief is not the standard of our rights and not the standard of morality, what is? Our founding fathers actually told us what they believed that was. What's the standard of our morality? One nation under God. How does it go? Um, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. In other words, you don't get to decide what my rights are. 
God decided that a long time ago. And that's, that's basically the grounds of, of, of our entire system of government. We know a majority opinion does not work for determining right and wrong. Does that make sense? Okay. In the third of Abraham, even though the majority voted for something, you know, like a state, like California, mm-hmm. the Supreme Court comes in and says, no, we are going to own 10 men. We are going to own the rule of your majority. Because mm-hmm. of what is going to happen. You are the person. Yes. It, it's just, it's, it's a very difficult thing to be absolutely. It is. It's, and the, the system itself is very difficult to work within because you have these rights. But then again, you have people who can interpret the rights or misinterpret the rights or whatever reason. Um, so it's, yeah, it, it becomes a, a a very difficult situation. That doesn't mean there's not an absolute standard. It just means that we can get into a mess trying to trying to argue about that standard at times. Okay, does that um does that make sense so far? None of these other things are working. Let's look at just a couple of more possibilities for what makes uh what people could say is the standard of right and wrong. Okay? Some people say that society is the standard of right and wrong. They claim that it's the overall belief and perspective of people. It doesn't have to be perfect, you know, 100% majority, it doesn't have to be the overall attitude and belief of a culture is what determines what is moral in that culture. Now, the problem with that is entire societies have taken wrong actions. And we look at them and we say, hey, whether we are a part of that society or a different society or outside of society altogether, we know what they did is wrong. Okay? For example, uh, if this were the case, it would mean that Nazi Germany, Soviet Russia, and cultures that practice cannibalism are not really wrong in doing those things, if that's the case. Because that culture gets to decide what is right. Nazi Germany decided that killing Jews was acceptable. That doesn't necessarily make it acceptable. Society doesn't work either. Okay? And here's one more, and this is the one you're probably going to hear the most. People will claim that this is how we determine right and wrong. The claim is that right and wrong is based on whatever helps the most. There is a technical term for this. It is called utilitarianism. Okay? And the utilitarian claim to morality is that whatever helps the most people and hurts the least is the moral action to take. And now that one, on the surface, that one sounds pretty good on the surface. However, um, it really doesn't hold up under scrutiny. There's two problems. First off, how in the world can you know all the possible results of a choice of an action and determine that because that it's going to come out best, and so you know that that's the most moral action. But number two, this is saying ends justify means. Ends do not justify means. Um, the example I gave there is, you know, suppose you have, um, over in Africa, you guys have heard about the AIDS crisis in Africa, correct? Just it passes on, people don't even know they're getting it, it passes around, people never know they have it until after they spread on to somewhere else. Huge portions of the population have AIDS. Suppose... Hypothetically, you have a society that, say, 25% of the culture, one quarter, a minority, has the disease. And uh, they're spreading it around. By the way, in case you didn't know, there are myths being passed around in some of these societies uh, about AIDS. There is a myth that if you rape a virgin, you will be cured of AIDS. People believe that's the case. And so they go around and they rape women thinking that it's going to cure them of AIDS. And in reality, all they do is spread it. Um, and so you imagine you have a society where that is the case. This disease is growing. It, there's no way to stop it. You've tried everything. You can't get them to stop. I can give you a guaranteed way to stop the spread. Okay? You can force everyone in the country to have a test, and you can kill everyone who has the disease. Now, you would be killing 25% of the population, and you would guarantee the safety of 75%. Is that morally right? But you're helping most people. I'll give you another example. I was watching an old movie from the 50s called The Unearthly. Um, Very uh, interesting movie. In it, a mad scientist is taking people into his house, and he's um, sort of actually, he's a doctor. He's very smart. He's like trying to help people through psychological issues. And when they get better, he takes them down to the basement. 
And uh, he performs these really uh, horrible procedures on them to try and find a way to make people live forever. And so in the name of science and of benefiting a lot of people, he's forcibly basically making, basically killing or making some people miserable. Why can't we do that? Why can't we just grab human beings and forcibly do human testing on them, even though it may kill them? Because we may kill a few hundred people, but in the process, we may save thousands. Is that moral? Because ends don't justify means. Um, it's sort of this idea that um, that morality is, or that, that things that, by, by simply taking a pure mathematical or pure logical approach to it, we can come up with a clear uh, definition of right and wrong. Now I'm going to show you a video, about a five minute video, that talks about that concept. You ever heard of a guy named Dennis Prager? Dennis Prager is not, uh, he's a very good guy, he's not a Christian, he is a Jew actually, but he has very good traditional uh, Christian morals. Very, very solid guy. And he talks a little bit about um, about this concept of right and wrong. Can we just look at something and from a completely logical, rational, scientific perspective say something is right? Um, and that's what this video is about. Now, there's a couple things I may mildly disagree with him on, and I'll, I'll mention those afterwards. But watch what Dennis Prager says about this. Okay. So... Um, the only way I'd really disagree with him is, I mean, I, I kind of think of morality is always the more reasonable choice, provided that you have all the information, provided you have the information that there is a God and who he is and what he is like and what his standards are. But um, he gets the point across, you can rationalize doing evil things. In fact, some of the most evil people in all of history have tried to make their beliefs rational. So this idea, you can just kind of rationalize out, you can kind of, you can just follow this utilitarian approach, doesn't really work. Okay? There is one more uh, place where we might possibly get our objective moral values. And I think this is the only one that makes sense. That's God. The claim is that an omnipotent creator who knows all possibilities and all future outcomes gave us a moral code to adhere by. And now that explanation works because only a being who is all-existent, ever-existent, and creator has the authority to really say something like that. Because you look at it, if you say that um, you know a whole society can be immoral, you're claiming that the authority of morality is higher than that society. Well, eventually you get up, the only thing that makes sense is there must be a creator. And as designer, of course, you get to choose how your design operates. Um, you know, if I could, if I was smart enough, I could build a robot. And if I built that robot to make me sandwiches, that robot is living up to my standard. But if something goes wrong and it starts setting my house on fire, at that point, that robot is no longer acting according to my will. And guess who has the right to say how that robot acts? I do because I built it. And if God is the creator of the universe and of all life, He's the one who has this authority to say by what standard we live. So that's the only one that really makes sense. So let's go over again that moral argument. We're not quite done yet, but let's go over this. Objective moral values exist if and only if God exists. We see that that is true. Objective moral values exist, therefore God exists. Makes sense. Any questions so far? But anything? Okay. Now, I will say this. There is another way out of this. A person who looked at this argument does not have to admit that God exists. There's another way that they can logically escape. Anybody know what that is? All right. Well, you can refuse to believe in God, or you can refuse to believe that there are objective morals. That's still, you're still following the, log the, the, uh, the argument logically if you say there are no morals. Um, the problem is nobody wants to deny morality. There are a lot of people who think that they want to deny morality. Nobody really wants to deny morality. So what happens if, um, if 
You talk to someone and they don't believe in God and you present this argument and they just say, well, then fine, I won't believe in objective morality. What do you do at that point, practically? Well, what I would say to do is force them to think their claim all the way through. Make them examine the consequences. Let me ask you, if there's no objective morality, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for our society? What does that mean for the world? No safety. No safety. There are no morals constraining people. That's a good point. Okay? What, what does that mean? What else does that mean? No laws. No real force of law. If there's no authority higher than the government, why does the government have the right to tell me I have to follow a certain law? Because it's just the government's law. If I can get away with it, then there's nothing wrong with it, right? And if, if you don't have law, um, you, you don't have any moral reasoning to pay taxes, you won't have a right yeah, if you're going to be consistent in saying you don't believe in objective morality, why should any of that constrain you anyway? So, right, you're absolutely right. Yes. So here are some um, exactly right. Let me give you guys some points, some explanation. These are some very some of these are kind of some graphic explanations, but they get the point across. If it is true that there is no objective morality then people who discriminate against others because of their race, that's not really wrong. Now, we may get upset about that and say, you can't do that. Well, why can't we do that? If there's no morality, why can't we do that? People who kidnap and force women into the sex trade are not really wrong. By the way, you know, we think that slavery ended in America a long time ago. It did not. The sex trade is an enormous issue in our country. Young women are taken by force and forced basically to be prostitutes and people make money off of them. Um, that is an enormous problem and it is sick and disgusting. But that goes on in our country. That goes on everywhere actually. It's scary how, how, how common that is. But if we're going to say there's no objective morality, how can we say that that's wrong? Okay. Look at some historical examples. Okay. If there's no objective morality, that means that Hitler wasn't really wrong when he killed six million Jews. It means that Stalin wasn't really wrong when he killed 50 million people. It means that Ted Bundy wasn't really wrong by raping and murdering more than 30 women. All right? And if that doesn't work, take it down to a personal level. Tell them this. The person who robs, hurts, and even kills your own family is not really wrong. If you don't like what they're doing, it's only just that. It would just be a matter of opinion. Your opinion is that they shouldn't do it. If... There is no objective morality. No one actually wants to believe that. Nobody wants to live in a world where that is the standard. Okay. Does that make sense? Do we all want to live in a world where there is objective morality? I absolutely do. Okay. Now, before we leave, I'm just going to talk about a few um, common objections to this argument. People will point out several things and try to argue against us because of that. Um, one of the common ones you'll hear is the euthyphro dilemma. Euthyphro dilemma. Now, this is a false dilemma. In other words, it's a logical fallacy. They give you a problem and they give you two options and they expect you to take one of the two. And whichever option you take, it's wrong. All right? This is a false dilemma though. There's more options. The claim is that either if, the claim is that if there is objective morality based on God, then either God um, adheres to morality, and so it's something greater than him, and that would mean that God's not sovereign, or God just kind of decides on what's moral and gives it to us, and that would seem to, that would seem to indicate that morality is arbitrary. And so those are two things that we don't want to admit. So the only solution to that is actually a third option that people won't give you, the option is that it's neither one. Morality is based on God's nature. It's based on who God is. In other words, why is it wrong to lie? Because God has to tell the truth or because God decided that telling the truth is good? Well, neither one. It's wrong to lie because God is truth. It's wrong to be unfaithful to someone because God is faithful. I think Jesus may have hinted on that in Matthew 5.48. He said, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. God is perfect, you be perfect. That is the highest point of morality. In fact, if you can imitate God, you are perfectly moral, simply by being like him. 
God himself, his nature, is the standard of our morality. Does that make sense? Okay. Another common objection here. What about different cultures? You know, you may go to one culture and, um, you know, it's considered immodest if you can see a woman's ankles. Go to another culture and women are almost completely naked, and that's considered perfect, perfectly normal. You have all these wide, varying standards. Why would we assume that, uh, that there's some absolute standard? Well, the answer is just because a society has different, some societies have different standards doesn't mean morality is subjective. Because number one, societies um, can be wrong about morality. Well, that's number two. They can be wrong, but also all societies do agree that there are some standards. They may disagree about specifically where that standard is, but we all agree that there are standards. Anyway, next objection. This is one you might see fairly commonly. The claim is that evolution explains morality. And the reason we think something is moral is because over years and years and years of evolution, we found that it is beneficial to the species as a whole. So it's moral because it's, it's beneficial to our species. There's two problems with that. Number one, no one can prove that that's the case. There are a lot of things I'm convinced that if evolution were true and that were the standard of morality, there are a lot of things we would think were moral that now we consider horrible. Things like rape. Rape promotes the propagation of the, the promotes the continuation of a species because it promotes reproduction. It doesn't make it moral. Um, but number two, even if that were the case, even if there, even if evolution were true, and that's how we learn our morality. That would only explain how we know what is moral. That doesn't tell us why it's moral. We know something is moral because it's good for the species. So why should we do what is good for the species? Where's the standard for that? Where's the authority in that? So no, it, it doesn't work at all. And one more common objection, and this is one you'll get as an emotional reaction. What about when Christians did blank? Now, um, that's not a blank you're supposed to fill in. That's just, that's not even in your notes. But um, this is one you hear. A lot of times people will point to immorality on the part of Christians or moral object objectivists and say, well, because you or people of your belief did that immoral thing, therefore, you don't have any right to talk about morality. Now, in reality, that's silly. That's actually a logical fallacy called an argument ad hominem. It's a special type called an ad hominem to quote you, in which you say, because you did something wrong, you have no authority to speak on that. Um, I'll give you an example. I was reading or researching something online at one point. I don't even remember what it was. And uh, I found this forum where these guys were arguing uh, against objective morality. They didn't think that there was absolute right and wrong. And the argument one of these guys used was he said he had found a statistic that showed that certain crimes like rape and murder and theft were higher in the southern United States, which is probably true. Also, southern United States has a greater, um, has a higher level of religious people. He said, therefore, it's the religious people that are doing these things, therefore, they, they, therefore there can't be objective morality. Now, that's wrong for a number of reasons. Number one, just because... There's a lot in areas where religious people live. It doesn't mean it's the religious people doing it. In fact, statistically, people who are deeply religious in nature are immensely, significantly less likely to commit wrong acts, statistically. Um, the other problem with that is these people who believe there's no objective morality, they're pointing to immoral actions and saying, look at those immoral actions those people are doing and try to use that to disprove objective morality but the problem is, they're claiming objective morality to disprove objective morality. They're relying on objective morals to say that there are no objective morals. That's just ridiculous. That doesn't make sense. They have to borrow from God to argue against him. Um, so that doesn't make sense. Plus, um, not to mention, Ravi Zacharias has a very simple, very plain answer to this. Never judge a philosophy by its abuses. Somebody claims to be a Christian and goes and does something absolutely horrible that Christianity is completely against. Don't say that's what Christianity did. Say that person deviated from their faith because that's what actually happened. Does that make sense? We are almost done. We are on the, on the home stretch here. So let me make this extremely important point. I told you at the beginning, this is an extremely controversial argument for God's existence. 
A lot of people hear something that you're not really saying when you present this, okay? People oftentimes become emotional. They react in a very aggressive way because, because they feel threatened, okay? People will commonly say, so you're saying that because, you know, they don't believe in God, then they can't be moral. They, they, they're not moral people, all right? Be very clear. That is not at all by any stretch of the imagination what this argument claims, We're not saying that atheists, people who don't believe, we're not saying they can't know what is moral and they can't make moral choices. In fact, the Bible says that they can. In Romans chapter 2, verse 14, Paul writes, when Gentiles who are absolute all-out pagans, right? When Gentiles who do not have the law, by nature, do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. The law is written on their hearts. I would argue, the Bible argues, that all people know what is right and wrong, and all people can choose to make moral choices. Because God has written his law on their hearts. He's given us a conscience. He's given us a means of determining right and wrong. Now, we can mess with that conscience. We can sear it. We can reshape it. We can affect it in some way. But God has given everyone a means to tell what is right and wrong. So we're not claiming they can't know what's right and wrong. Okay? Here's what we're claiming. This is the most important point. What we're saying is that the philosophy of atheism cannot justify morality. Not to say they can't know morality. Not to say they can't believe in it, but they can't justify it. If a person doesn't believe in God, morality makes no sense. So, really, this argument is a matter of making people think consistently through their worldview and realizing that their belief in morality is opposite their belief, or their belief that there is no God. So, they can't hold the two rationally together.